Thank you very much. It, it is a pleasure to be with you. I'm not sure I can live up to all of those, uh, those comments, uh, but thank you uh, for the very kind introduction. Um, it, it's especially a, a pleasure to be here um, and an honor to be here because I, I consider myself a son of this institution. Um, I was uh, in your seats before we had the m and Mars Lecture Series, um, but I was in your seats 15 years ago. And 15 years ago, I left here with a foundation of training and a foundation of um, a, a mindset that led me toward uh, a service-oriented career. I, and, and that's much of what I'll talk about today. Um, so we'll talk about accounting. We'll talk a bit about the intersection of accounting and law. But we'll also talk about um, a few contemporary topics in business. Because what, what we know about the professions, whether it's the legal profession, whether it's the accounting profession, whether it's business as a discipline, what we know is that things are moving quickly, things are changing, technology has a role in that. Um, there are a number of other uh, significant mega trends that are influencing careers. And so part of my message um, to you today will be that success, whether you're in business or any of the other disciplines, requires a certain level of agility. Where you start is unlikely to be where you end. And so think about that as, as we talk about uh, really two things today. I'll set up um, a discussion uh, during the first part of the presentation talking about my journey, talking about uh, the background of the firm, uh, the, the different services that PwC uh, provides to clients, uh, not only here in the US, but also globally. And I'll, I'll build that out as a foundation and as context so that you can understand um, my point of view whenever I lay out then in the second half of the presentation some suggestions for um, what's happening in business. And you can reach your own judgments about what that means in your own preparation for a career in business or in accounting um, or wherever in, um, in society that your chosen field takes you. So I'll, I'll let you make uh, your, your, own, uh, your own judgments there. But before I move off sort of, sort of page one, I've got to do one thing. And, and that is um, to say a special thanks to my parents, who um, I still choke up. They sacrificed significantly for me to study here. I know many of you have similar stories. You have similar. Um, situations where people sacrifice for you to get started, and so I wanted to thank, say thanks. So with that, um, let's, uh, let's start. Uh, again, as I said, we'll talk about the firm, we'll talk about the marketplace. Um, let me start first with, um, with my journey slide, and, and that is to say, uh, from the days when um, when I studied here to today, I've done a variety of things. Um, I've uh, focused on uh, clients here in the Harrisburg office. I graduated in, in 2000 after doing an internship. Uh, in, in 1999, I did an internship. It was really two packed into one. It started out with um, an internship in our audit practice. And then I pivoted from there, and I did an internship in our tax practice. That was really helpful. If you're thinking about internships, let me really reinforce the value of internships because it gives you an on the ground daily um, introduction into the world of the career that you're preparing for. You might have an internship and decide that that closes the door. You might have an internship and decide that, uh, that that opens the door. But that's an opportunity to really get some experience um, into um, how you will form your foundation for what comes after it. So I started my career 
first as an intern and then started as a full-time associate in our Harrisburg, Pennsylvania office, working on a variety of clients. So along those same lines, um, starting in a smaller office enabled me to see a number of different business models. I could understand, uh, because I worked on, um, a banking business model. I could understand a venture capital model, which was sort of the predecessor to private equity and hedge funds. I grew to understand a distribution services uh, business in the telecom space, not-for-profit, education, and so forth. So having a variety of experiences really enables you to find a business model and a subject area that you can really get, uh, get excited about, get passionate about, and then really dig deep on. So for me, that was banks. So I took that experience um, and I built toward, um, toward my next step, which was um, moving to our Washington DC practice. I moved there um, at, the, at the request of the firm because at the time, this was the early 2000s, at the, at the time there was a very significant um, restatement that um, had not yet been announced, but but that our firm was working with, um, with the board of directors to uh, evaluate the magnitude, evaluate the impact, and then ultimately um, evaluate the corrections that were required within a given set of financial statements. So um, I got the, the, the call to, um, to move. I responded to that call, um, and I moved to our Washington DC practice, where then I spent the next five years roughly um, working um, on that restatement, working on subsequent accounting and reporting issues that followed it, um, and uh, picking up a law degree at American University. So a lot of people say, why a law degree? Why not a business degree? Why not a master's of accountancy? All of those are good areas to think about. And what it really comes down to is um, your personal interest. But I think much more foundationally, um, what I encourage others to focus on is engaging in continuous learning. And that may be through a degree, that may be an academic program, that may be sort of an, an MBA at the firm. So finding an environment where you're continuously learning in an area that is subject to change. So for me, it was the study of law and how that intersects with accounting. Much of law is about how people relate to each other. What are the rules of the road? Whether it's, um, whether it's a matter of statute, whether it's a matter of how we treat each other, whether it's how we negotiate complex business arrangements. What are the rules of the road? And so for me, that was an area that was really accretive to my accounting degree. That was really accretive to my interest in accounting. My primary interest was then, remains today, in the way individuals um, develop, prepare information, business information, and then communicate it. And so there's a whole system, as we know, a whole system that depends on financial information being credible, being prepared in an honest way, so that investors can make their own decisions about how to allocate their capital. So um, that's, been, uh, that's been my journey. Um, my journey, of course, continues at the firm. Um, and uh, if, um, if we meet again, in the coming years, uh, we'll update each other on, on where that journey is taking us. So um, back here at E-Town, um, as a student, uh, as a member of Delta Mu Delta, let me, let me uh, make a plug for our um, on-campus academic fraternity. Um, I, I sought to understand the dynamics of a career in accounting. Understand my lens. My lens was that of a relatively unsophisticated kid from rural uh, Pennsylvania, wonderful place to grow up, 
Um, my parents were small business owners. Um, they were family small business owners. That was true for my dad. That was true for my mom. That was true for each of their parents. I make that point because your background really informs your judgment about where you yourself are going. At E-Town in particular, you have the benefit, you have the distinct privilege of a significant amount of investment in the study of family small businesses. Because much of that is your background just, just the same as it was for me. And I hope, you'll, I hope you'll take advantage of that. I hope you'll also see that as you come from a background, if yours is similar to mine, where the daily conversation is about the rewards of an up market in the family business or the burdens of a down market in the family business and the follow on complexity of how that impacts. Are we going to meet payroll? What are we going to sacrifice? I hope you'll take the opportunity to learn from that because those lessons are critically important to understand understanding business on a much larger scale. You can take a lot of really valuable lessons from small business because the core of the judgments about whether you have a successful business idea or one that was once successful but no longer is, those core concepts remain the same regardless of size. Now with size comes complexity within an organization, comes complexity in management and risk management and so forth, and all of those things are topics that you can learn and develop. But don't miss an opportunity to take a lot of benefit from small business. So let me start. Um, let me add to, to, to that perhaps a conversation about um, as I stepped into a career in accounting from that background as the son of a small business owner and as the son of this institution, what did that feel like? So when, when I started uh, the firm in the Harrisburg office, Candidly, I was, I was focused on the next two years. That was my planning horizon. I thought, you know, I'll, I'll get this started. I'll get a cup, you know, the required hours to get my certification as a CPA. But two years and then I'm out. That really speaks to, at the time, my commitment level on my side of the equation with the firm. I had a two year horizon. What I challenge you um, to not learn as I needed to learn is that careers are more than two-year horizons. They're a lot longer than that. And so I challenge you to think a bit more broadly about where it is you want to go. So I've added the, uh, the Yogi Berra quote, which, which I love for its simplicity, but also in some ways its complexity. A plan, wh whether you're a graduate from E-Town with very little insight into what it means to be an accounting professional or a business professional or a legal professional, a plan is no less important to you. So the question is, how do you get that? How do you develop a plan? That's the role of your mentors, which are professors, which might be family members, which might be colleagues. Spend time, intentionally spend time getting feedback about what your career aspirations really are. Develop a vision. Develop a tactical approach. Focus on a horizon that's broader than two years. So what I found as I started the firm, I was very fortunate to get some wonderful feedback 
from partners and other mentors and managers who are willing to invest in me and to give me some genuine, authentic, and sometimes very challenging feedback. So feedback that said, you know what, Wes? You need to think a little bit more broadly. Um, you know what, Wes? You need to think a bit more about the business side of your clients as much as you do about the technical side of your clients. That feedback is a gift. So I'd encourage you to find organizations that are willing to invest the time that it takes to enable you to see the value of a plan and the value of getting feedback so that you can grow and develop. So as I started in the firm in the Harrisburg office, I had that feedback. And over time, what I heard was uh, clients and others say, you know what, that was, that was valuable insight. We value that. Wow, that made a difference for us. And so for me, um, that, was, that was a shift. That shifted my perspective into the world of the possible within a professional services firm and the world of the possible in an accounting career. It's a world that, um, that I'll talk a bit more about as I talk through what it is that we at PwC do. So I'll spend uh, the next couple of minutes uh, talking about three different business lines at the firm. But there's an important point as I talk through each of these three business lines. Even though I've separated them into three different slides, you should understand that we approach the marketplace as one firm. What we find is that our clients have issues and questions and problems that they need insight on. And they don't come in and say, I've got a tax problem. Or I've got a strategy problem. Or I need some credibility added to my financial information. They come in and they present a problem. And what they need and what we provide are professionals who are conversant about the full breadth of business issues. And the way we organize our firm into three different business lines is just for administrative ease. But as a PwC professional, what we're looking for are people who are familiar with, conversant with business issues so that they can understand and translate them into solutions. So let me spend just a minute on the assurance business. Incidentally, I hang my hat in the assurance business. I hang my hat in a subset, an industry focus within the assurance business. But as I do that, the issues that I work with clients on cover the full scope. Whether we're doing audit services, tax consulting, advisory strategy work, execution work, those all cover the full landscape of the firm. So the assurance business, just to unpack that terminology a bit, what we're adding is credibility of PwC's opinion that some information as presented is trustworthy, is representationally faithful, and is accurate. We don't take that lightly. So when we are hired to do that kind of work, we sort through, before we agree to do that work, we sort through the person that has asked us to do the work. We want to understand who they are as a company. We want to understand their culture, their values, before we agree to do business with them. We'll, we'll talk more later on in the presentation about the importance of culture and values and business relationships 
but think about, think about some of the significant calamities within the business environment. Those are calamities, in some cases, of business models, in some cases, calamities of a failure of judgment. And so we spend a tremendous amount of time understanding who it is that we're doing business with before we agree to, agree to do business with them. In the assurance business, um, that's, again, the business where we're adding um, our brand as an indication of um, something about a set of financial information. You know, I, um, so I have a three-year-old son who um, every morning, um, Sam and I, um, Sam and I spend a couple of minutes eating cereal together, <laughs> right? So his favorite cereal is Panda Puffs. Have you guys had that, right? Um, Panda Puffs is organic, right? Branded as an organic cereal, uh, which um, my wife and I read as, well, sounds good enough for Sam. Um, and so we, we feed it to him. The question, though, is, as an auditor, how do you know that's true? How do you know that's representationally faithful? Is it some portion is organic? Is it some portion of the ingredients are, in, are organic? And whose standard? So we spend a lot of time in our assurance business thinking about, well, what is representationally faithful? What is the standard? And so our stakeholders in that discussion, of course, include investors, people who have a seasoned understanding of what the financial statements are intended to communicate. That's our primary stakeholder. That might be a bank lender, that might be an investment fund, that might be a pension fund. But it's all designed around a, an investment professional. But one of the significant questions facing our profession, and for each of you who might join the accounting profession or go into business, is how does that user group change over time? And what are the expectations? Well, what if the expectation for, and I apologize for the size of this, this is a balance sheet of almost $2 trillion from one of my clients. And it's got a significant amount of mortgage assets on the balance sheet. Well, what, what are the expectations, perhaps, of society relative to those financial statements? What are their needs? We as a profession consistently and continually need to engage that question because that question runs to our relevance. As accounting professionals, if you're moving into the profession, you're entering a profession that requires you to be thoughtful about who's using your point of view, your opinion. That's something we at PwC take very seriously. And, and we'll talk more about that as we talk about why we do what we do. So let me jog through our tax business line. Tax, you'll think of that in a straightforward way, since we're close to April 15th. Um, you'll think of that as your own. Let me see if I, this is a corporate return, not, not a personal return. So. If you're business-minded and you have your own corporation, perhaps you're familiar with that. But um, you'll think of that as compliance. But do you also think about tax on the other side? It's a source of revenue for the government. So we, as a firm, think about both sides of the equation. Society depends on us having a point of view 
about both sides of the equation. A system should be fair and equitable, is it? It's a source of revenue and it's a source of government and government's role within society. Lastly, our advisory business. Our advisory business takes strategic questions all the way to questions of how to get things done. We cover all industries. We cover um, businesses around the globe. Um, and we set, set that out on problems that, um, that we brand. If, if you read the journal, you've, you've seen this picture a couple of times. It's part of PwC's um, current marketing strategy titled, Getting the Extraordinary Done. Well, how do we do that? It depends on people, people like you. So our advisory business, within our advisory business, we're working with companies to remain relevant and to solve some of their hardest problems, whether it's logistical problems with an airline or whether it's using data and data analytics to help solve cancer. So we cover the full scope. So importantly, you get to a question, well, if that's what you do, why do you do it? This is an important question that you've already been introduced to. At Elizabethtown, what you know and love about this institution is that it's focused on the purpose of educating, not for the sake of being smart, but for the sake of providing service. That is foundational, and that's something that um, is outwardly focused and is action-oriented. At PwC, understand, we think about it in very similar ways. At PwC, we have a global, globally relevant purpose statement that guides every one of our business decisions about the clients we serve, about the businesses we get involved with, about the investments we make. It drives our culture. It drives our training. And it's designed around really two concepts. If it doesn't meet these two concepts, we're not in that business. So the first is, how do you build trust in society? That's a privilege. It's a privilege to be part of an organization that globally is focused on a constructive mission of building trust. We're not tearing it down, we're adding to it. That doesn't mean that, uh, that we have a weak backbone. We've got a very strong backbone. We call balls and strikes as we see them. But it's all for the purpose of building something and it's for the purpose of building that within society. That guides how we provide services, not only to corporations, but to governments. We cover the full landscape because covering the landscape for us means that we will be relevant to society. And without being relevant, we're subject to change and we're subject to uh, going the way of, of uh, another, a number of other businesses that have failed. So our, our first focus is on uh, building trust in society. The second element of that is we look for and we tackle problems that are not easily solved. We look for problems that are solved only by the collection of some of, the, um, some of the deepest thinkers within society, whether they're here domestically or global. Um, we do that across all of our business lines. So um, how do you sort of do that? Well, let me give you just, just an example to, to make it a little bit more real. Um, one of my colleagues here, Abby, Abby Price, is in our Philadelphia office. I hang my hat in our Washington, D.C. office. Um, both of our offices, combined with the rest of, of our major markets across the U.S., 
every year contribute time and talent and money to send people to the country of Belize. We've done that for over a decade. And what we do in Belize is we help them build a country. That's amazing to think about, that you can harness the good of what we have and the resources of what we have in making a difference for an entire country. That requires the commitment of time and energy of all of our people. We ask all of our people to contribute to that. We ask the firm and our partners to contribute significant amounts of money to do that. So we're solving important problems for society. Let me turn the corner and, and, and just talk generally about the size of the firm. Globally, uh, we have roughly 210,000 people. Within the US, we've got roughly 41,000 people. And that generates globally roughly $34 billion of revenue every year. So that's, that's a big set of operations. Excuse me. The question is, well, how do you grow? And how do you remain relevant? And so, as you might anticipate, we've spent a lot of time thinking about that question. Because our success depends on people. We're not selling products. We're selling services. We're selling ideas. And so, in many ways, we're in the people business. Next year, in 2016, 80% of our people will be from the millennial generation. Think about that. 80% of our people. And so, what does that require? That requires a lot of thought to prepare for the vast majority of your workforce having a set of expectations and values that are different from perhaps the owners of the firm. And as we motivate them, and as we prepare them to be the next generation of, of owners of the firm, we commissioned uh, the London School of Economics University of Southern California to do a really deep global study of the next generation. We did that a couple of years ago. Published it, it's available on our website. It remains today one of, one of the deepest uh, thought pieces on the needs, the expectations of the millennial generation. There are scores of books on the topic, um, so I don't mean to discredit those. But for us, it was a business imperative. It wasn't just an abstract question. It's a business imperative about how we remain relevant, how we have the skill sets to tackle current business issues, to identify what they are, to identify solutions to them. So think about perhaps your parents, what might have been important to them in the context of business. It was somewhat transactional. The former generation, my generation, was willing to um, exert a significant amount of personal investment into their careers. They were looking for control over their work. Ultimately, they were focused on getting to the top and getting to the highest paycheck. That's not a value judgment. That's just a couple of generalizations regarding what was important to that generation. And so at the time, we had a firm that reflected those values. But importantly, if your firm is changing, and ours is, you've got to shift. And so a couple of years ago, we shifted to the next generation of employees and ultimately owners. And so what, what's important in their context? It's a bit more about work-life balance. It's a lot more nuanced about finding purpose in the work that I do. Still wanting to be successful, 
not giving anything up in terms of career progression, but finding a lot more balance between um, what I'm doing outside of work and what I'm doing inside of work. Asking for fair compensation as I balance those two things. And so our firm, a couple of years ago, we'll talk more about this in a minute, developed um, branding what had always been part of our culture, which was flexibility to find time to do things outside of the office where they're important, regardless of how that fits into the normal business hours of the day. So think about what that requires. Our senior partner, Bob Moritz, just recently published an article um, in the Harvard Business Review, you may have read it, that walks through programmatically, strategically, how we, how we administer that. One thing is we hire more people. From a client perspective, we still provide the same level of attention and quality and responsiveness regardless of when they call. But instead of one person doing that, we have a team of people doing that. It might be two people, it might be three people. In order to create the flexibility for all of our people to manage their lives. In my case, it's real. I manage my own life getting a law degree while being a highly rated manager within the firm. I have a family. I spend time with my son Sam every morning and every evening. The only time I don't do that is if I'm on the road. My wife, incidentally, is a career-minded lawyer. She spends a lot of time with our son uh, working from home three days out of five. She happens to do that, interestingly, um, where her employer is the federal government. So the expectations about organizational um, commitment has shifted, and we're an organization that needed to identify that and transform along with it. I hope you'll find, um, as, as you yourself work through, where it is you want to spend your time and attention after you leave this place, I hope you'll focus on what that culture is and what those values are. So you might say, um, what makes a good entry level hire? Right? You're thinking about, well, what do I do when I wrap up work here at E-Town? How should I be thinking about how to be successful in the business world where I might have been successful in the classroom? What's it take? I think it's somewhat straightforward. This is sort of my, my favorite pyramid, if you will. Um, we start with the foundation of, of um, intellectual aptitude. aptitude right? We start with a real commitment to understanding um, and possessing a thorough understanding and knowledge of the subject matter that, that we're working with. That's a given, that's the price of admission. Two things stack on top of that. Emotional quotient. You've gotta be able to interact with a team of people. You need to lead when it's your time to lead. You need to be led when it's your time to be led. You've gotta work in the context of teams, whether it involves people within your organization or also includes people from outside your organization. So that cultural and emotional quotient is critically important. But those are just three necessary but not sufficient steps. It takes one more thing to be a really high performing professional. It takes passion. You've gotta wake up in the morning with an interest, a personal interest in what you're doing. And that comes over time. So it takes passion and stamina and commitment to doing that over time and it's sort of back to my own personal story. 
when I started at the firm? Geez, I'm not sure I had that. Right, I had a two-year horizon. But it de you need to develop that over time and you get feedback about ways to do that. So let's get, let's get practical for a minute. Um, this is where I'm gonna pivot. So we've talked about sort of the background of careers. We've talked about the background of the firm. And now we're gonna talk about a couple of contemporary topics in business so that hopefully you'll agree with me as we're done that a career in business requires agility. Let's, let's talk about uh, what's happening within society overall. Our firm did a substantial amount of global research on the question of what are the drivers of change within society? And for us, we boiled them into five what we call megatrends. Different companies have a couple of different titles, but megatrend seems to be one that captures what it is we're focused on. So it's not an individual company, it's not an individual country. It's a significant source of change. And clue, you gotta know what the change is, you gotta know what's changing so that you can plan and adjust to it. So let's think about that. Shift in global economic power. Global economic power is shifting eastward, not westward. That's a shift. So what does that mean? As you think about where a lot of the trade and manufacturing jobs have been located, it's generally a shift eastward. What if the services business followed the manufacturing business eastward? That tells you something about the level of perspective that is important to have as you're thinking about a career in business. You need to have a global perspective because the location of your talent pool, if you're working in the US, may shift. You've gotta have that cultural dexterity to shift with it. One of the other megatrends, demographic shifts. In the West, people are getting older. We are generally an aging population. So what's that mean? That means you've gotta think about, as capital has been accumulated and saved, capital will now shift toward more safe resources and be drawn down. So what's that tell you about your career? You've got to think about resource scarcity in a different way as capital is consumed. So it's generally an aging population. Think about urbanization. Are you in the real estate business? The major real estate markets are urban markets. Why? That's where the higher paying jobs are. Why? Because we're concentrating around technology and around ideas, especially in the US. Cities are growing, not shrinking. Rural America is shrinking, not growing. That's a major shift. And so, as you think about your own career, you need to think about where you're gonna live. If you're thinking about living in rural America, that can be fine. But you need to develop an expectation and a strategy for what it is that you're going to do. Because you've got a headwind. You've got a headwind that says, a lot of the work is moving to urban environments. Climate change, resource scarcity. Think about the rush for water, for natural resources. So what are the skill sets that you need to operate in Africa, for example? Well, that tells you you need a whole system, a risk management system that can be resilient in the face of things like Ebola. What if your workforce is in Africa? So Ebola 
terrorism threats, right? There's resource scarcity, which drives the location of where, of where we put people. And then technological breakthroughs, right? Who's the next gazillionaire um, simply because they've developed an app, right? So this is somewhat of a busy slide. It does two things. The top row is the result of our survey of CEOs globally about where they will be investing their company's money in 2015. That's the top row. The bottom row is 2014. Same people, same question, where are you investing your money? You see a shift, OK? So you see a shift that says global CEOs are investing more in the US than China, more in the UK than Brazil, more in Japan than Russia. So you read that and you say, well, wait, hold on, time out. You just told me that everything's moving west. How is it that the US just popped ahead of China? What's the story? The story is that this is where global CEOs are investing for 2015. That doesn't tell you where they're investing for 2022, a longer time horizon. And the important career point for you is that business change is fast. And it shifts. It's shifting toward the advanced economies because they're more stable. When stability returns around the globe, the megatrend, the, the, the underlying factors that are driving eastward will continue. So you've got to be dynamic as you think about your career. Here's another cut of the data. So what are the sources of change within industry? Better than half of CEOs identified three, three and several more, but um, three major changes. The first is government regulation. What does that tell you? That tells you that society, speaking through its government, wants something different from business. We just came through a financial crisis that nearly everyone felt the effect of. And society, through government, is saying, we don't want that. And so you've got to shift. The other two drivers are equally fundamental. Competitors, new entrants into your marketplace, eating your pie, that's a significant source of change, and the customer experience. All of us have a very different expectation of how we interact with business. We want to do it through our phone, electronically. In some cases, we want a relationship. In other cases, we want a transaction. Those changes are driving then the second question of, well, before we get to the second question, which industries are disproportionately affected? Think about banking and insurance. Do you want a trust-based relationship and are you willing to pay for it? Or do you want a transaction? I'd wager most of us want to interact with our financial institution through our phone. How many of you have walked into a teller and said, you know what, here's my weekly paycheck. I'd like to deposit in, it into my account. Thanks for being you. One. So, so we've got a handful. The question is, are you willing to pay for that? Over time, there's a preference toward saying, I'd rather have no or low fees for, doing, for engaging in that transaction. And I'd rather have that over the benefit of walking in and seeing someone face to face. So those industries within the boardrooms and the executive management teams are focused on the fundamental shift that's impacting their business. What are CEOs doing? There are three real interdependent approaches to dealing with that change. I'm going to focus on the middle one, which is partnerships, because it gets back to a fundamental skill set that I'd ask each of you to think about as you prepare for a career in business. That is partnerships. If you're a small organization, 
looking to access different markets or respond to a different competitor through technology, you've got the fundamental question of how you're going to pay for a new technology platform. So you can build it and own it, or you can partner with someone who has already built it. Most people go with the partnership route. Think about the music business. The recording industry has wonderful content built up over decades. They spent decades delivering that content through cassettes, eight tracks, CDs, DVDs. Guess how they're delivering it now? Online. Is it their own business? Nope. It's Pandora, it's Spotify, it's other companies that have built and gathered capital to build delivery mechanisms. And they do that through a partnership. Think about our own firm. PwC and Google have a partnership where we get the best of Google and Google gets the best of us. Why do we do that? We do that because Google has invested extraordinary amounts of capital in workplace connectivity. PwC has a need for connectivity around the globe as we deliver globally insightful points of view. So we've got a joint venture. We're one of the only firms to have done that. This slide simply tells you what, what we've already talked about. We're partnering to get access to technology. By and large, that's, that's the biggest driver. So as you think about competition, what does it really take? Are people hiring? Absolutely. But they're hiring skill sets that are relevant to that environment. Business skill sets, accounting skill sets, but also the STEM skill sets. Science, technology, engineering, math. We hire all of those. We've got a significant business investment and service built around data analysis. It builds on all of those skill sets. So let me conclude and we'll get to, to Q&A. The world's changing. You need to know what that change is. You need to respond um, and seek out organizations that enable you to stay current and relevant and to build business acumen as much as you build technical skill sets.